Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Peaceful Sabbath. Today we are talking about fasting and prayer and how it's able to produce a breakthrough. A lot of people get right to the limit, but they never break through what they're going through because they don't continue. I might have to put that in the song. Let's start with the scriptures. Give me Psalms chapter 35, and let's take a look at verse 13. Psalms chapter 35, and we're taking a look at verse 13. The scripture says, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned into mine own bosom. Now what the scripture here is talking about specifically is what do you do when there is a sickness? See, we have people who get sick and then what do we say? Oh, bro, I'll pray for you. <laughs> I'll pray for you. How, when's the last time you fasted because somebody was sick and you wanted them to be healed? Scripture says, but as for me, when they were sick, not when I was sick, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. The clothing of sackcloth represents great humility. It says, and I humbled my soul. What is my soul? What part of me is that? That's my body. I humbled my body with fasting. So the scripture right here tells you what it is that you need to use in order to humble yourself. If you are in a very prideful state, and you're like, man, I feel very prideful. I'm not entirely sure how I get rid of that. I keep praying. Well, something is missing from your praying. It's called fasting. Because it says, I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. What does that mean? Where's my bosom at? It's my chest. You got to say it with your chest. Okay, I sent a prayer out. And what happened to the prayer? It came back to me. What does that mean? It was answered. Why was my prayer answered? Because I humbled my soul with fasting. So here in this verse, we find David and he is praying and fasting and he receives an answer to his prayer. A lot of times we have obstacles in our life, things that we just can't seem to get over, right? We can't get over. It might be something that happened in our past and we can't seem to get over that thing. It might be something that's happening right now in our present, and we can't seem to get around that thing. Why is that? Because you're not called to get over it. You're not called to get around it. You're called to go through it. Because through it, there is experience. Now, there's a popular cliche that says, if Yahweh Shai brings you to it, He'll bring you through it, and that is true. But that does not apply to everything because there are many things in our lives that he did not bring us to. We brought ourselves to them. We walked right up to that thing and said, here I am. And he's over there saying, follow me. But we're here facing a giant thinking, well, the Lord brought me to it. No, that giant that's in front of you, he didn't bring you to that. You brought yourself to it. Now you're screaming, come and help me, Lord. And he's like, safety is over here where I am in my shadow. If you're following me, then you were walking in my shadow. Nothing could possibly harm you. But the fact that you've gone off the path and you are now standing in front of a giant that you can't seem to get over and you can't get around. You just got to go through it. That's going to require some prayer. That's you talking to the Lord. But it's also going to require some humbling of your soul. I want you to refer to fasting as the humbling of your soul, not the going without food, because <laughs> that's what we think. If I said to you guys, what's fasting? You'd be like, oh, I don't want to fast. I want to eat. We think of it as going without food. From now on, refer to it as the humbling of your soul. Give me Psalms chapter 69, and let's take a look at verse 10. Psalms chapter 69. We're taking a look at verse 10. The scripture says, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. What is David doing? First, he's crying, right? 
And then he is chastening his soul with fasting. He's correcting. He is humbling his soul through the fasting. And that is to his reproach. Now watch this. When we're going through something difficult, one of the first things that we stop doing is eating. When our mind is clouded, you're the spirit which controls the mind and the mind controls the body has a natural program. If you get really worried about something, let's say your children are sick or you're just it's a it's a very difficult situation. Nobody feels like, man, I need to feast right now. The first thing that happens is you're like, oh, I can't eat. Why can't you eat? Because the spirit has had a conversation with your mind and the mind has told the body, don't be hungry. So your body is prepared to fast when you're going through something. The problem with us is we don't look at it on the proper spiritual level. Now, we remember that there's three levels to everything. Spirit, mind, and body. The only way that your mind can control your body is by putting the body under subjection. That's what David is referring to when he talks about chastening my soul with fasting. He means putting my body under my mental control and my mind is under my spiritual control. So all of a sudden we have this desire to stop eating. We think it's because we're worried. No, that's that sign. When you're like, this thing has worried me so much that I've lost my appetite. I'm just going to go right into fasting. It has already triggered in me that I should be fasting, but I need to put something together with my fasting. See, with the Most High, a lot of things go together. We have the law and we have the, okay, and then we have faith and we have, okay, that's pretty good. And then we have fasting and we have prayer. You have to have those things together, fasting and prayer. We will waste time looking for a way around it or ignorantly, uh, trying to challenge that thing when sometimes we just need to sit down, humble our flesh, fast, and pray. Breakthrough. Breakthrough is about endurance. Um, it doesn't usually happen with one big push unless you have an enormous amount of strength. If you have an enormous amount of strength and you can do one big push and push through that thing, that's not usually how breakthrough happens. It's a bunch of prolonged, small pushes that finally get you through that thing. I want you guys to think about, um, you guys know what, so someone who makes a sculpture, okay? They're making a sculpture out of stone. They have a big old block of stone and then they have a hammer and then they have a chisel. And watch this, no matter how strong they are, boom, they hit that thing. Does it instantly become a, a statue like Michelangelo, an angel, a wink? Nope, it doesn't. The first time they hit it, boom, nothing happened. Boom, boom. He sits there and he hits this thing 99 times and nothing happens. What if he gave up right there? Ah, oh, man, this thing is taking too long. <laughs> got the hammer he's he's already put in so much effort but what if on the the 100th hit tink a small piece falls out of it you know what that's called breakthrough he's made a breakthrough through the tough exterior now if he continues to chisel away at it he's going to slowly shape this thing into a masterpiece into a work of art our problems in our life are just like that. You may not fix it the very first time that you put all your strength into one hit. You may have to continue pushing through, continue enduring until you see one small pinhole, right? It's all darkness and you're pushing through this problem and you're like, I just can't break through. I just can't break through. And then you continue to endure and boom, all of a sudden there's one little bitty pinhole. It's literally the size of a mustard seed, but there's something you can see coming through it. There's light in it. All that darkness you've been pushing through, you made that little hole and now there's a little bit of light shining through. Do you give up then? Some people do. What are you supposed to do once you start seeing the light? Now you press toward the light. You keep hitting it and you hit it harder and you hit it more consistently and it begins to break through. And, and the hole becomes larger and larger and eventually it's big enough for you to get through what you're going through because you continued. Does that make sense? This, this is very important because no matter what it is that you're trying to do, like I want you to think about someone who has an addiction. 
they have the addiction for as long as they have the desire to continue doing that thing. When the desire stops, they do still have the addiction, but now they're exercising some discipline. Okay, and as you're exercising this discipline, you're going to be constantly reminded every day, every moment that, wow, I want to do that thing that I'm addicted to, but you don't do it and you continue being steadfast. You continue to persevere day by day. It doesn't happen one big push, but day by day, the desire for that thing begins to wear off. And then you, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to realize, man, I made a breakthrough. The thing that I thought that I could never do in my whole life, I actually broke through and I did that thing. Now, was it the day that you broke through or was it all the days leading up to it, the consistency, the continuing, the enduring that created the breakthrough. What would you say? What do you think? Did the first day, day three, the last day, it's all of those days. So with fasting and prayer, there has to be a consistency. Give me Psalms chapter 109, verse 24. Psalms 109. We're taking a look at verse 24. It says, my knees are weak through fasting and my flesh faileth of fatness. What happened right there? <laughs> what happened in this verse? His knees is trembling. They, they shaking. Why? Because he feels weak. Because when you don't eat for a long time, don't you start to feel weak? You literally feel weak in your flesh. Your flesh is no longer strong. See, it's easy to defeat your flesh when it's weak, but when it's strong, it's, it's, it's fully taken over everything. Then it's a little bit difficult to deal with. Now he says, my flesh faileth of fatness. Do you guys know the number one selling self-help book in the whole world is about losing weight? Yep. Everybody's like, oh, how can I lose weight? How can I lo look? You see what that scripture says? It says, my flesh faileth of fatness. There it is right there. I need to take a book and just put that on every page over and over. And be like, this is how you lose weight. You just stop eating. <laughs> you stop putting it in your mouth. And if you stop overeating for a long enough amount of time, your flesh will fail of fatness. I don't know. Some people don't like that. Fasting is also a, a form of sacrifice. What is sacrifice? When you have something of great value and you give it up, you make a sacrifice. Okay, now for a lot of us, grubbing that um, Texas Roadhouse and that pasta, them Bosa donuts, all of that good stuff, that's of great value. We spend a lot of money and a lot of time sitting down eating. Sometimes when things are not going the way that we need them to go, we're not supposed to be going out to dinner and pretending like everything is fine. We're supposed to be sitting in our house, fasting and praying for a breakthrough. Nothing ever works out better because I'm sitting at the table and I'm just pretending like my problems don't exist. But when I cry out to the most high God, when I humble my soul, when I continue to do that, there's breakthrough on the other side of that. Let's talk specifically about fasting. Fasting is the action of choosing to abstain from some or all food, drink, sometimes both, for a period of time. Now, the Most High has put this into your everyday practice. Most people are not aware of this. You fast every single day. You're just missing that other part. What goes with the fasting? We got fasting and we need some Okay, we got fasting and we have some prayer. From the time that your head hits the pillow to the time that you put food in your mouth the next morning sometimes is eight. If you're lucky, 10. If you're lazy, 12. <laughs> 12 hours. You just went 12 hours with no food. But when your head hit the pillow, did you start praying? Were you thanking God for everything that happened in the course of the day, whether it be good or bad? Did you just give thanks for every single thing? Did you pray to actually wake up tomorrow and have a better day tomorrow than the one that you had yesterday? See, sometimes the reason why tomorrow looks just like yesterday is because we didn't pray about it. We fasted because when your head hit the pillow, 
you stopped eating. Then when you woke up, did you pray and thank God? I woke up. There's a possible, there's somebody somewhere within a couple miles of me who did not wake up today. I don't want to be them. I actually woke up. I have food in my refrigerator that I can go and eat. So I'm praying and thanking the Lord that there's food here to eat because there's somebody within a couple miles of me who woke up and they didn't even have any food to go eat. They were forced into fasting. I chose it. See, so now I'm fasting and then the first meal in the morning, what's that called? Breakfast. That's that's a weird way to pronounce it. If I took the word break and I put the word fast after it, I would call that break fast. What am I doing? I'm breaking the fast that I started last night. But the reason why it wasn't very effective is because I missed the prayer. I didn't combine the prayer when my head hit the pillow. I didn't combine the prayer when I woke up in the middle of the night and thought, man, I don't know why I'm awake. You're awake so that you can take this time and be grateful for God. I didn't pray when I woke up the next morning. I just got up and started eating. So we fast. He has worked it into every single day. It's almost like having a hidden superpower that you don't know how to activate. Like, what if I told you, you know, you can walk through walls, right? And then I showed you how you could walk through walls. At first, you'd be kind of mad. You'd be like, I could do this all along. Do you know how old I am? And I never did this before. Why did I never do this before? Because you never knew that you could do it. Now, some of these problems that we're dealing with on a regular basis, you know, you can overcome all things through Christ, right? You know that, right? How do you do that? Well, some of these things don't come out except by fasting and prayer, prayer and fasting. Now, I know people who think that they can fast from social media. If you are addicted to social media, then yes, you can do it. If you are a casual user, come check this right here. Check my emails. No, that's not fasting. Fasting is meant to humble your soul. Okay. Let's talk about some um, examples of fasting in the scripture. What's the first one that you guys can think of? Who fasted? Who? Daniel? Daniel fasted. Okay. But the Daniel fast is no such thing. Uh, that's one of those misconceptions in modern day Christianity. There is no Daniel fast because Daniel was eating, wasn't he? He was eating some food other than the food that the king was giving out. Now, the king was giving out his meat, and his meat happened to include unclean food. And he said, I'm not going to eat that. You just give me this and this and some of this and some of that. That's not a fast, right? He was not allowed to eat the king's meat. It was unlawful for him. Nowadays, people look through the scripture and they find a scripture like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to do the Daniel fast. <laughs> What in the world are you talking about? Okay, who else? Who else fasted? Yahweh Shai fasted. How long did he fast for? 40 days and 40 nights. Did you guys know that his fasting for 40 days and 40 nights is the revealing of a picture of somebody else who fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? One of them happened in the Old Testament. The other one happened in the New Testament. Who is it? Who fasted for? We have the law. Who's, who would we say is the law? We know it's Jesus, but who gave the law? Moses. How long did Moses fast for when he got the commandments? 40 days and 40 nights. How long did Yahweh Shai fast for? 40 days and 40 nights. Watch this. Give me Exodus chapter 34. Let's take a look at Moshe. Moses. Exodus chapter 34. Give me verse 28. Scripture says, and he was there with Yahweh 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Wow, that's powerful. He wasn't eating nothing. He wasn't doing like a so-called Daniel fast where I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have hamburgers, but I'm not going to have anything else. <laughs> he didn't eat. So can you imagine how his stomach was grumbling like you guys know that uh, he's up there in the mountain and they're down here partying and they keep hearing some thunder it was probably Moses's stomach because he was no no I, I, I guarantee the Lord sustained him while he was up there but he was breaking down his flesh to the point where he was absolutely 
humbled in the presence of the Most High. What about this guy, um, Jonah? Jonah didn't fast. Who fasted in the story of Jonah? We're going to take a look at it, but I want you to see this. Um, Jonah, who was an Israelite, was sent to the land of Nineveh. Those are Hamites. And he was told, I want you to go there and preach repentance to these people. And if you don't do it, they're all going to die. If you do it, you might be able to save all these people if they repent. Now, your job, Jonah, is just to go and do it. And Jonah was probably like, well, but they're not Israelites. They're not even my people. Why am I going and talking to them? And the Lord was probably like, just do what I told you to do. <laughs> Obedience. Okay, now watch this. Jonah goes the complete opposite direction. He's like, I'm, I'm not going to do it, Lord. I'm going to do what I want to do. Jonah dies in that process. Jonah comes back to life. Three days and three nights, the same as Yahweh Shai. You guys know that's a picture, right? Okay, three days and three nights, and then we have this. He comes up, and he's on the beach in Nineveh, and he preaches repentance to the people, and what do they do? They repent, and a part of their repentance is fasting. And what goes along with fasting? Prayer. Give me Jonah chapter 3. Let's take a look at verse 4. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. <clears throat> Watch this. The scripture says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Let's take a look at this real quick. Because the Lord told you see the 40 days in there, right? That's crazy that there's that picture. The Lord told Jonah, I want you to go and preach to these people. They have a grace period. <laughs> they got 40 days. But at the end of the 40 days, I'm going to destroy every single one of them. You go and you tell them they got 40 days. What comes along with 40 days? That's right, 40 nights. Okay, so Jonah goes into the city. It takes him from where he comes up a whole day to get there. And when he gets into the gates of the city, he begins to preach repentance. And he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, give me verse 5. It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. Who spoke to them? God spoke to them. Whose mouth did he use? See, that, that's powerful right there. He used Jonah's mouth to speak. Because I, I point that out because God is going to speak to our loved ones, our family members, our co-workers. He's going to speak to them, but whose mouth is he going to use? He's going to use yours. Now, you need to make sure that you have the word of God in your mouth so that he can use you as a mouthpiece. The scripture says, so the people of Nineveh believed God, look what they did, and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Huh. That's weird. Because these people are not even Israelites. They're Ninevites. Nineveh is one of the regions that uh, King Nimrod founded. You guys remember King Nimrod? He's the guy who built the tower. Nineveh is one of the lands within his province. So they don't fear the Lord, but the Lord said, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to destroy you and it's going to be all bad for you. Let me send a man. They could never have heard the word unless somebody was sent. Let me send a man. He's a disobedient man, but I can still use him. He's the kind of guy who wants to go in the complete opposite direction, but I'm still going to use him for my glory. Does that sound like anybody? It sounds like me sometimes. Sometimes I'd be going the complete opposite direction, but the Most High still uses me for his glory. He sends Jonah. Jonah preaches repentance to them, and it says, and they proclaim the fast. They put on the sackcloth. That's a great sign of humility. From the greatest, that means the king, even unto the least, the guy who was already wearing sackcloth sitting outside on the street, and he's already been fasting because he has no money to eat. From the greatest to the least. Give me verse 6. Scripture says, For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, I want you to see the sackcloth and the ashes is a picture. If you don't repent, 
you will be sitting in these ashes in the lake of fire. So it is a sign of the greatest humility. Some people, they would rip their garments. They would take the ashes and sprinkle them on their heads, or they would take dirt and sprinkle the dirt on their head, and they would lay down what we refer to as pros, 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 I can't think of the word. It totally left my mind. They prostate. They, prostate. they would lay down prostrate on the ground it's prostrate not prostate don't worry about that they lay down face down on the ground their hands spread out with their face to the earth it's a sign of being dead i am dead i am making a picture of me being dead to my sin because if i'm not de dead to my sin my sin is going to kill me that's what it's a picture the bible is filled with pictures pictures and scriptures now watch this give me verse seven Scripture says, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. This dude made the animals fast. He's, he's real serious about his life now. He's like, nah, uh, <laughs> right? You're like, Rosie, get away from the ball. <laughs> you going to mess around and get me killed, <laughs> right? Watch this. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. That's a serious fast. You proclaimed a fast and you have enforced it upon animals. <laughs> Everybody. But see, but you know what? As I said that, I realized that some of these people were probably acting like animals. Yeah, that happens. Okay, now watch this. <clears throat> Give me verse 8. He says, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. That crying unto God, what is that called? That's the prayer. He says, they, he put sackcloth on animals. <laughs> he made them fast and he said, you guys just scream out. You guys know when animals are starving, they also bark or scream or whatever they're going to do. They make some audible sound. Humans do that. We cry out. I am so hungry. How long do you think they did this fast for? Because in the beginning of this thing, Jonah said, in 40 days, the Lord is going to destroy this thing. Now, they took it serious on day one. When do you think they started the fast? The same day that he spoke to them. What do you think? They stopped. Oh, the sun is down. Let's eat now. No, see, you have to fast to see if it works. You have to continue to endure beyond the point. Your faith has to be stretched all the way up. How long do you think they fasted for? The Bible doesn't say, but how long do you think? All 40 of the days. Because how will you know if it's working? You started fasting on day one? You fasting on the next day? What are you going to do? Stop on day 10? And then day 40 comes and you die and you're like, if only there was 30 more days. No, you're going to fast all the way up to day 40 to see if the fast is working. You're putting your faith in this thing. you got to continue to endure. When day 40 came and they didn't get destroyed, think about how much more they were praising God at this point. Praising God for what? We still have life. We still have breath. We still have our whole city. My children didn't die. We didn't die. And then when they finally can eat, the food's got to taste different. It's got to be the best food you ever ate in your life, no matter what it is, because you're grateful for it in a whole different way than you ever were before. Give me the next verse. No, no. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yeah, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Who, who could tell that? Nobody. So they had to fast and in their fasting, they were doing it in faith. Because who could tell if that's going to cause him to do it? Nobody knows. We got to just keep doing it. And I know you're hungry, but we just got to keep doing it. Now watch what the scripture says next. Verse 10. And the Most High God and God saw their works. What did he see? 
Look at that. That's very important. He saw their works. Okay, but what were they doing their works in? They were doing it in faith. They saw He saw their faith and their works. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. What does that mean? They repented. And God repented of the evil. That means he turned away from what he said he was going to do to them. That he had said, oh, sorry, that's what it says. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Wow, fasting and prayer is extremely powerful. We just saw an example where it can save your life. All right, let's talk about Jesus now. How long has Jesus fasted for? 40 days and 40 nights. A whole lot of pictures in there, right? He's in the desert. He's being tempted by Satan to turn stones into fettuccine and delicious steak and all that stuff. So I'm like, why are you going to turn them stones into bread? If you're going to go ahead and do something amazing, just do something. Turn this whole thing into some donuts. What? You're going to make it regular old bread? Make it delicious. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil came and tempted him, and he had a breakthrough, didn't he? Every time that Satan came to present an idea to him, he continued stead. What's the other part of that one? Oh, you know that. Steadfast. He continued steadfast. That means he continued to stay focused, persevering, and he was looking for this breakthrough. Now watch this. When Jesus instructed his disciples about fasting, he did not say, if you decide to fast. That's not what he said. He said, when you fast. What does that mean? You have to fast. You're going to fast. This is built into you. Now watch. Give me Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Scripture says, moreover... If ye fast, no, nah, see, it don't say that, does it? Because <laughs> that if it was if, what would that mean? You got a choice. <laughs> he says when, what does that mean? You got no choice. The only choice you have is when you're going to do it, not if you're going to do it. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites. You mean hypocrites fast too? Yeah, hypocrites do fast. Hmm. Well, what do they look like when they fast, Jesus? He says, of a sad, sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. When they're fasting, what are they fasting for? So that people can see that they're fasting, because then they'll look holy. I don't want to look holy. I want to be holy, right? If the reason why I'm fasting is so that you will think that I'm holy when you see me, if you think that I'm holy, I have my prayer has been answered. I received my reward. Now, I want you to see that the scripture says that one thing produces another thing. There is a cause and an effect. It says, moreover, when ye fast, that's the subject that we're talking about, fasting, be not as the hypocrites. How are the hypocrites? Of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Now take a look at the last line. Verily I say unto you, they have their what? What do you get for fasting? You get a reward. You get a breakthrough. Something in your life is going to change because you have decided to humble your soul. Right? They have their reward. Give me verse 17. He says, but thou... When thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. Am I supposed to be looking homeless out here when I'm fasting? Nope, I'm supposed to be looking like I'm healthier than ever. Why? Why, Why am I going to do that, Jesus? Give me verse 18. It says, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Now, point, check this out. It says that when I fast, the Lord is going to see it. And what am I going to get? I'm going to get a reward. That reward is my breakthrough. That's what we are doing this thing for. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, that you feel like you need a breakthrough on, you're going to need to learn to deny your flesh. That's what produces the breakthrough. Give me Mark chapter 9, 
verse 17. We're going to take a look at a scripture where Christ teaches the power of fasting and prayer. What you got? So her question is, is fasting only food and drink? Let's take a look at that real quick. Hold that, Matthew. We're going to Isaiah chapter 58, and the scripture will answer. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Uh, let's start it at verse, give me a, verse four. Nah, let me see. Man, I don't want to take it too long. Okay, we're going to get into it. Give me verse three. Isaiah 58, verse three. Now, this is us and we're replying to God and we're saying, what have we been fasting for if we're not getting a breakthrough? Because <laughs> some people do this. Remember, you do this every single day, every night. You break the fast in the morning. When you are going through something heavy and your mind is worried and you're in fear, you also start to fast. But it's not the same as what he's referring to. And we're going to see the whole thing put together. So the scripture says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the now that's the question that they're asking the Most High. The next part is the answer. He says, Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. He says, on the day that you're supposed to be fasting and afflicting your soul, you're still doing everything you want to do. Now, he's specifically referring to the great fast, the great day of the fast. What day is that? The day of atonement. So on the day of atonement, even if you're going without food and water, but you're still exacting all of your pleasures and doing everything that you want to do, you're not fasting. Give me verse four. He says, behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. See, verse four is starting to talk about the reason why we fast. We, we're not getting into the how you do it yet. He's talking about why you do it. Because if you're doing the right thing, which is fasting, but you're doing it for the wrong reason, you are not going to produce the result that you're looking for. If you're fasting so that you can win conversations and arguments and debates and so that you can appear to be holy like Christ talked about, to make your voice to be heard on high, that's not what fasting is for. That's actually going to build up your flesh instead of break it down. Verse 5. Now he's going to tell you what a fast really is. He says, is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? See, that's what we think a fast is, right? Okay, well, you're not going to eat. You're going you're gonna to just sit there and you're going to do the sackcloth and the ashes. Watch, he tells you the reason why you are in sackcloth. He tells you the reason why you're not eating. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. He says, the fast that I desire is for you to be like Yahweh Shai in the presence of those that are without. So let me explain this. This, this is really simple. The reason why you're putting on the sackcloth is because that's what you're going to wear today. But what you was going to wear, you're going to go out and put that on somebody who's homeless. The reason why you're not eating is because everything that you would have eaten on that day, he wants you to go out and bless somebody else with it. That's what he means when he says to break the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and all that. You're going without is one part of it, but you should be blessing somebody so that they have something to go with. Now, somebody is sitting homeless on a street corner somewhere and you come walking up and you give them a whole outfit. 
here you go some shoes some socks okay i got a fresh hat that matches that and you're like man i like that hat that's what i was planning to wear today but i'm going without that so that now you can have clothes on your back shoes on your feet and guess what i didn't just come with that i came with a meal too Oh, that's a fast because now you are really afflicting your soul. You're really making a sacrifice. You're really going without those things that are so precious to you. Now watch this. Give me verse 7. The scripture is going to say exactly what I just said. It says, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. See, he literally just said, the reason why you're wearing sackcloth is because you gave your clothes away. The reason why your stomach is grumbling is because you fed somebody else. That's the fast. Now, I want you to see what that type of fasting produces. Verse 8. He says, then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Okay, when the light breaks forth in the morning, what just happened before the morning? It was all darkness. It was all night. But that first light pierces through the veil of the darkness and it produces light and everyone can see it. He says, then shall thy light shine forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily. How do I get to be healthy? I fast and I pray and thy righteousness shall go before thee the, the glory of the Lord shall be thy look at what it says re reward because when I fast what do I get a reward okay but the glory of the Lord is going to be my re reward I'm getting doubled up right here okay look verse 9 it says then shalt thou call and Yahweh shall answer thou shalt cry and he shall say here I am if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke that means the bondage that you're putting other people in the putting forth of the finger what's that that's when you're pointing out other people's mistakes and speaking vanity verse 10 and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, what, what part of me is my soul? My body. What does my body need to do? Get up out of the house and go find somebody who's what? Hungry. If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. Is it dark at 12 noon? There is no darkness at 12 noon. So he says, there will be no darkness in you once you start doing this. And look at what else it produces. Verse 11. And Yahweh shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water who, whose waters fail not. So we find out here in Isaiah that it's not just the physical. In the physical, yeah, it's you going without the food. But there's a mental and a spiritual aspect to it. Even with the reward, there's a physical reward, but there's a mental reward and a spiritual reward. Most people only look at it on one level, which is I'm going without food. Here we can clearly see that it's providing for someone else. Does that answer your question? With 10 million scriptures? Hallelujah. Okay, now give me Mark chapter 9. We're taking a look at verse 17. Mark chapter 9, verse 17. This is where Yahweh Shai is going to explain a very important part of the fasting and the prayer to his disciples. Mark 9, 17. And one of the multitude answered and said master I have brought unto thee my son which hath a dumb spirit <laughs> well he didn't call his son dumb what does he say his son has he's got a spirit inside of his body and the spirit is dumb what is that what is it what does it mean to be dumb I know we use this word all the time but it actually has a meaning and it's not the one that we think what does it mean it means you can't speak that's all it means you dumb 
We use that all the time. That just means you can't speak. Okay, watch this. Verse 18. And whithersoever he taketh him, now he's referring to the spirit taking his son, and with and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. That means he rips him up. And he foameth. That means he's slobbering at the mouth. And gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. To pine away means to continually do something over and over and over and over and over. How many overs? Over and over and over. To pine away means once the spirit takes control of him, he does this thing and he won't stop doing it. He'll just pine away. It says, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And they could not. Could the disciples cast him out? The disciples can't cast out this, this demon. Okay, now watch this. Give me the next verse. He answereth him, this is Christ, answering the man and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. <laughs> okay, bring your kid over here. Let me handle this business real quick. Now give me verse 20. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, that means when he, the spirit, saw him, the Christ, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. You guys ever seen a kid in the supermarket or when they don't want to leave and they throw themselves down on the ground and they start flailing their arms and they're screaming and they're rolled over? That's called wallowing. They wa But this guy, he's foaming at the mouth. So something is coming out of him at the same time. He's wallowing and he's foaming. Give me verse 21. Now Jesus is looking at this kid doing this and he turns to the father and says, uh, and he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. Take a look at this. This is very powerful. Jesus knows the answers, doesn't he? He wants to know, does this man know how long his son has been afflicted? Is this something that he's like, let me just take the opportunity. Jesus is here going over there. This man's going to fix you like a watch and I'm going to pick you up later. Or have you been suffering along with your song? Do, your son, do you know how long he's been dealing with this? What is your role in your son's life? That's Jesus knows the answer, doesn't he? And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this, meaning this spirit, came unto him? And he said of a child, this dumb spirit has been in his, his son ever since he was a child. Watch this. Give me, oh, give me the next verse. I'm sorry. And often and oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on, does it say have compassion on him? Does it say help him? So now we've, we've in that little piece, we see the reason why Jesus asked him a question that he already knows the answer to. What is your role in this? Are you distant from this problem or are you suffering along with your child? Now watch, it says, and oft he cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us. That's me and my child and help us. This man has joined himself into the affliction of his child. So he's not like an absentee father where he's like, yeah, let me just drop you off and I'll pick you up in a couple hours and you're going to be all fixed. Some people do that with their children when it comes to like therapy. They're like, I'm going to put you in some therapy. I'm going to drop you off with this man who doesn't know anything that's going on. And I'll be back in an hour to pick you up and you better be fixed. That's not what's happening here. This man is actively involved. He joined himself to his son. Okay, now give me the next verse. But he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, what is that? He has faith. He's like, I believe you can do anything. Can you help us? Jesus answers and said, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. How many things? We got to get our belief game better. If Jesus himself told you that all things are possible to him that believeth, 
and you are lacking something in your life, like you're still struggling on something, it's because you don't believe you can actually do that thing. I believe when the scripture says I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, I actually believe that. That's the reason why I can do so many different things. You'd be like, can you do this? Like, yeah, I know how to do that. Can you do this? Yep, I can do that too. Why? Because I believe I can do all things through Christ. Now watch this. Jesus says to him, all things are possible to him that believeth. Verse 24. Let's see how this man who has a son that is suffering responds to this situation. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He says, I, I truly believe. I really do. But I just need a little bit of help. Because I just experienced something which challenged my belief. See, I went to some people who say that they represent you. And they weren't able to do what I expected them to do. I believed that they could do it. I was like, come on, kid. We're going to see these people over here. Nice man. This is my child right here. I need you to cast this spirit out of him. And he wasn't able to cast the spirit out. So that created unbelief in the, in the man. But now he's saying, help mine unbelief. I believe that you can do it. So let's get on with it. Give me verse 25. It says, and when Jesus saw that the people came running together. Why are the people running together? This conversation is happening and there's a kid wallowing and foaming on the ground, screaming and around. He's doing all of that stuff. You, you guys know that's embarrassing, right? So now... A crowd is starting to form because this kid is having an episode. Sometimes we see kids having episodes and we don't consider the fact that might just be an unclean spirit that's making you do that. You're doing that thing and you do that on a regular basis. That reminds me that Jesus said, how long has he been doing this? Ever since he was a child. But at least the father knew this is not an appropriate behavior. This is not how it's supposed to be. There is a spirit in him that makes them do this. Now, nowadays... We just say, he needs medication. <laughs> he got ADHD. He just needs a little something. We don't consider the fact that maybe there's an unclean spirit in there that needs to be cast out. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit. What does this word rebuke mean? What does it mean? He corrected the foul spirit, saying unto him. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to the spirit. I've seen people try to cast out demons before and they talk to the person. You guys know that doesn't work, right? When there is an unclean spirit, there are two entities there. There's the person that has it and there's the unclean spirit that's in them. The person, you got to get them out the way so that you can deal with the unclean spirit. And Christ gives us a perfect example. Saying unto him, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. That, man, that's beautiful right there. If ever I needed to cast out an unclean spirit, my instruction is right there. I'm not going to come up with something better than what Christ himself said. And the proof that it works is in the very next verse. Oh, well, let me light some candles, bro. And let me, let me get the homies over here and let's surround you and let's all hold hands and pray. Where are you getting this stuff from? It just looks holy. All you got to do is believe what did jesus say before this all things are possible to them that believe to him that believeth. okay so i believe that if i say exactly what christ said i can cast this spirit out the disciples probably believed that same thing but there was something missing you guys remember remember what we're talking about today fasting and prayer had the disciples been fasting nope because they can't fast when the bridegroom is with them so Jesus himself explains later on in the story, I'm going to give you the punchline. He says, you couldn't have done it because this one doesn't come out except with fasting and with prayer. You might have believed, but you needed to add something along with that belief. Give me verse 26. The Bible says, and the spirit cried and rent him sore. That means it ripped him up and came out of him. And he was as one dead what did this kid look like he did <laughs> jesus what in the world is going on i brought my watch to you to get fixed and you broke it more than it was i could deal with him throwing himself in the fire but now he's dead 
you know, that the, the dad was probably tripping out at this point, right? He looks like he's dead. Scripture says, in so much that many said what they say. He did. <laughs> Wait, there's a whole crowd of people gathered around. They were, do you, what do you guys think? Did they think Jesus was going to be able to do it? Maybe not. They're just there for a show. See, sometimes when it comes to holy things, people just show up because they want to see something. And what they first saw probably challenged all of their faith. Because he did. That's what they think. He did. Okay, now watch this. Verse 27. <laughs> but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. That is powerful. Amen. Verse 28. Watch. And he was, and when he, that's Jesus, was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, uh, <laughs> you know that uncomfortable laugh? They was like, you ask him. <laughs> no, you ask him, bro. He, he loves you. You, you ask him. Um, how come we couldn't cast him out? What does the scripture say? Verse 29. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. You have to have these two things working together in order for this type of unclean spirit to come out. Now, uh, can you start fasting at the moment that you need this power? Or should you have already been fasting before building up this power? You need to have been building this thing up so that your instant win in season and out of season. This is the reason why fasting and prayer is so crucial you have to again you fast every single day right head hits the pillow you wake up the next morning you put that coffee in you broke your fast that's called break fast but were you praying during that time all of that time watch this <sighs> give me matthew chapter 4 verse 4 this will be my last verse we'll break <laughs> We're going to break the message for lunch. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. This is a miraculous thing. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We are commanded to fast at bare minimum one day every single year that's the day of atonement we are commanded to go without food and without water to afflict our souls so that we can humble ourselves now watch this is the reason why because what happens on the day of atonement every year for every person who afflicted their souls what happened to all of their sins they are forgiven so a part of your sins being forgiven has to do with the afflicting of your soul the afflicting of your soul produces humility so that you are now standing before the Lord. You are without spot. You are without blemish. And you are also humble. Does that make sense? You can't stand in front of the Lord and you're like, I'm full of pride. <laughs> That's not going to work. It's not going to work. When the Day of Atonement comes up this year. Is it September this year? It's the 10th day of the 7th month. I don't think it's. No, because it's the 7th month, October. Nah. I'm not going to do the math and the counting right now, but we do know that the months are off by two. I don't remember what day it is. October 5th. October 5th. That's the 10th day of the seventh month. When it comes through this time, I'm going to give you a little nugget that helps you to get through it. Every time that you're feeling even slightly hungry, let that humble you. Every time that you're feeling even slightly thirsty, let that humble you. Let me see. It says... Day of Atonement is Wednesday, October 5th at 7 p.m. We will be here at the church celebrating that. That will not be a feast. We will not be eating. We will be here crying out to God, humbling our souls with fasting and prayer. Amen. Appreciate that. Every single time that you feel even the slightest bit of hunger, you thank God. What are you thanking God for? I thank you that I'm hungry and that I have food to eat. There's somebody sitting on a street corner somewhere right now, and they don't have food to eat. They're, they're more hungry than I am, and they can't fix this problem. I am humbling myself. I am afflicting my soul. 
I could go and eat because you have blessed me with an abundance. Like I can just open up the fridge and be like, what, pop pies? And I got popsicles and I I got pop I can drink. I had to throw a third pop in here because it's popping. (laughs) You're thanking God because you have all of that stuff and you have humbled your flesh to be obedient to your mind. Scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that was in Christ Jesus was led 100% by the Spirit. We need to have that mind in us. So that's the process. When you're thirsty, you give thanks to God. If you feel like, man, I'm just going to go grab something to drink. Now I got to take this and give it to somebody who's thirsty out here in these streets. It's a bottle of water. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to go without so that you can have the food that you would have eaten. I'm going to go without so that you can have. Are you guys understanding how that whole thing works? I'm glad that you asked that question about Isaiah. I was planning to get to it towards the end, but I think it worked better in the middle of it. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. This is the message that I have for you today. 